This is my presentation on the lay of Marie de France. To start off, I wanted to give a little bit of a run through on courtly love and what it is, um, although we already went over it a little bit in class. So overall, it's a genre of poetry. It began in the high middle ages in southern France, and it was spread by the poems and music of the troubadour, who were musicians of the court that would either stay in one court and, you know, write poems and songs, or they would travel to other courts and kind of spread their stories around. So some of the central motifs that were established are that there's always an inaccessible but beautiful woman. And she's inaccessible in that she's either in a marriage already or she's physically locked away. And there's a noble knight who is sworn to serve her and he has kind of an intense chivalrous devotion to serving her and giving her all sorts of gifts. And there's a forbidden passionate love that is shared between both of them. So. There's a love coming from each side of the relationship and they're both trying to pursue it passionately. And there is an impossibility or a danger of consummating that love. So for certain reasons, they cannot be together or there are consequences of being together. Some other aspects are that it is only involving people of the nobility. It's adulterous in nature always. So typically during this time period, you have arranged marriages and courtly love is kind of a response to the restraints of arranged marriages and it's ritualistic in the devotion of the knights and their like chivalrous actions trying to win over the women and it's an emphasis on love that is not prearranged and is passionately pursued by both sides um, the love must be equal and faithful so there can't be any huge imbalances on either side of the relationship and both parties must be faithful to one another and loyal so although courtly love is represented in poetry, it's kind of still questions if it was actually practiced or if it was purely just written about. It was also seen as a social game that was played by the nobility. So you have a bunch of different knights kind of vying for one or more women. And it's a kind of game to see which one will win out with their chivalrous deeds and such. Something interesting to note is that women exercise a good amount of control over the situation, over the choice of their lover and the lover himself. So they get to choose whichever knight is the most devoted to them, and they can kind of choose what kind of actions they want the knight to perform in order for her to choose him. And this is a notion that you'll see in Bisrevre, which is the first lay that I'm going to talk about. The woman exercising a lot of control over the courtly lover that she has. And there is a question of whether or not it's misogynistic or empowering for women. So there's kind of representations of both in courtly love. The woman is objectified and seen as worthy based on her status and her beauty rather than her personality. She's seen as an object to win over, but she has a good amount of control over the situation where she could choose the most devoted and courtly knight, and she also elevates her social status in doing so. So... I wanted to ask, in your opinion, do the ideals of courtly love present to be empowering to women, or are they still held back by misogyny? Or alternatively, if you were a noble woman in this time, would you find the practice of courtly love appealing? A brief intro to the Lay of Marie de France. There are a series of 12 short lay um, that were all set in the Brittany region of France. Um, they were written in Anglo-Norman by Marie de France in somewhere around the late 12th century and they exemplify or glorify many different aspects of courtly love. And here's just a little map of the region just to give some context to where the lay are taking place. The first lay I'm gonna talk about is Biscavre. So Biscavre is a baron. He's a good and handsome knight who conducted himself nobly. Overall, he's a courtly man, he's loyal. He's loyal to his wife in that even though he withholds the information of him turning into a werewolf from her, he only does it out of her best interests, and eventually he does trust her with the information. And when he does eventually, almost permanently, get turned into a werewolf, he does um, devote himself in service to his lord, um, instead of kind of falling prey to the negativity of his situation. So overall, Biscavre is a loyal man, he's courtly, and it's contrasted with the selfishness of his wife. So his wife is kind of seen as selfish and vain. After Biscavre reveals his situation to her, she it's stated that she no longer wishes to lie with him. So she kind of has a superficial reaction to his situation, um, one of disgust, not wanting to touch him or be near him or 
generally lie with him anymore. She lacks any sympathy for his situation, no worry over her loyal and devoted husband and, you know, how terrible a situation it must be. And she takes one step further by then seeking to get rid of him. She manipulates the courtly love of another knight um, for him to kind of do her bidding. And they eventually plot to steal his clothes and hide them so he remains in his werewolf form. So this knight, he loved her for a long time. He wooed her ardently and served her generously. So he's kind of seeking out a courtly relationship with her. However, she had no feelings for him whatsoever. And it even says that. She had never loved him or promised him her affection, but now she told him what was on her mind, and she eventually explains and uses his feelings to manipulate the situation for her own benefit. So the lessons on courtly love that I drew from this story, um, they're kind of emphasized by the revenge that Beast Clevere takes on his wife. So he exacts his revenge by ruining her vanity, which is the tool that she used to manipulate the knight's love for her. It says, just hear how successfully he took his revenge. He tore the nose right off her face. What worse punishment could he have inflicted on her? So this statement is kind of drawing attention to the importance of the manner in which he took his revenge by ruining her vanity. And this is further emphasized by all of her children lacking noses after the fact. So ruining her vanity, you know, the tool that she used is kind of an important point. And in general, the story is denouncing uncourtly love and acting uncourtly. So having a love that is selfish, having manipulative love and an unequal relationship because she's, she doesn't have any love or affection for this man, but she's utilizing his love and affection for her own good. So that's unequal. And in general, it's denouncing being vain and acting unloyal. So my question is, Though an important aspect of courtly love involves adultery, Beast Clavier's wife acts unfaithfully and sees harsh consequences. Reflecting back to the first question that I posed on the misogyny versus empowerment of women in courtly love, how does the choice to make a woman act uncourtly and be punished in this specific way complicate or help answer my first question that I posed? So the next lay is Equitan. Um, he's a king. He's generally seen as a courtly man. The text states that he adored pleasure and amorous dalliance, and for this reason he upheld the principles of chivalry. However, he betrays the loyalty of his seneschal. Um, the seneschal has a very beautiful wife, and Ekitan kind of gives in to his overwhelming passion for her and tries to steal the wife from the seneschal. So the seneschal's wife, she acknowledges that there is a huge status difference between her and Ekitan because he's a king and she is just the wife of a knight. And she tries to argue with him once he reveals his love for her that because of their status difference, he'll love her and then he'll leave her. And they will never be able to have a love based in equality and loyalty because of their status difference. And Ekitan tries to kind of coerce her into starting a relationship. Um, he says that leaving her would be not courtly and that a wise and courtly lady like her will be sought after with courtly behavior. So he's promising that he will seek her out with courtly behavior and he won't leave her. He'll be loyal to her. And he eventually pledges himself to her service and he promises to treat her as if she were of a higher status than him. So she eventually gives in and they enter a relationship. And because he's a king, he needs to have a wife, but they're in a secret relationship, so their relationship is holding Ekitan back from having, you know, a wife. So they eventually plot to kill the Seneschal, and it backfires on them. So they get discovered in the midst of having one of their meetings, and Ekitan accidentally kills himself instead of the Seneschal by dunking himself into boiling water. Um, and as a response to that, the Seneschal kind of takes revenge on his wife by dunking her head in the boiling water, and then both of them are dead. So the lessons on courtly love from this story, um, it's described by Marie de France as a cautionary tale against, firstly, having unrestrained passion. So even though Ekitan is seen as being a chivalrous man because he has, you know, all these passionate relationships, having too much passion is a bad thing, and he gets in the way of a loyal, kind of devoted relationship for his own passionate reasons, and it backfires on him. One of the cautions is also aiming to harm others, and that's pretty straightforward. The text says, evil can easily rebound on him who seeks another's misfortune. So both of them are plotting to kill the Seneschal, and it also backfires on them for that reason. And in general, this story is kind of cautioning against having an uncourtly affair. So having one that is oh, like overly passionate, as I mentioned, 
and the idea of it being unequal and unbalanced. So the Seneschal's wife brings this up when Ekutan first reveals his feelings for her, and it's true, they do have an unbalanced relationship, um, being that he's a king and she is definitely not of that status, and he does kind of use his status to manipulate and coerce her into having this relationship. So at any point in that relationship, it was not an equal relationship. And it also breaks the loyalty of Ekitan to his seneschal and the wife to her husband. So overall, an uncourtly situation going on. So the question I wanted to pose is, if the choice to make Ekitan act uncourtly, is it an unusual narrative choice? Would it be more persuading as a cautionary tale to a reader at the time to maybe see a man act uncourtly and receive this punishment rather than only just a woman as we saw in the previous lay? The next lay is Shiver Foil. Overall, I saw this as more of a celebration of courtly love and it's this story is coming from the myth of Tristan and Isolde and it's a myth that was well known at the time. So uh, not a lot was kind of explained in the text, but readers at the time would have understood what um, Marie de France was getting at. So you have Tristram, who is the nephew of the king and the queen, they have a secret passionate affair and the queen is restrained by her title. So they can't make their relationship public because she's the queen, he is the nephew of her husband. So they have a secret relationship, but it's a devoted and pure relationship. However, the text says their love was so pure that it caused them to suffer great distress and later brought about their death on the same day. The text doesn't elaborate on that because everyone kind of knew the myth at the time. So I guess she didn't feel the need to keep going with the story, but they had a really pure love, a uh, devoted relationship, and they would send messages to one another with honeysuckle and hazel branch. So in nature, honeysuckle kind of grows around hazelnut trees. And you can see in this picture on the right, you see the honeysuckle winding around the hazelnut tree. So Tristram leaves a message for the queen carved into hazel branch. And the honeysuckle and the hazel branch is a symbol of their relationship, how their love is intertwined and also private because he's leaving this private note for her. It says, the two of them resembled the honeysuckle which clings to the hazel branch. When it has wound itself round and attached itself to the hazel, the two can survive together. But if anyone should attempt to separate them, the hazel quickly dies, as does the honeysuckle. So overall, they have a really tightly entwined nature and destiny. So Tristram leaves this um, note in the hazel branch. They eventually meet in secret. They have this joyful reunion, but eventually they must part again. And the queen, she's weeping because she's so upset over them having to part. But Tristram is joyful at having had this short little reunion. And he eventually composes this lay um, for the harp because he's a harpist. So pretty short representation of courtly love. And I wanted to ask, why do you think Marie de France chose to end the story here rather than elaborating on their eventual death together? And could it be because she wants to have a more hopeful representation of courtly love or focus more on its purity, especially contrasted with kind of the negative um, outcomes of some of the other lay? And this is a um, painting that I found of the two of them that I thought was really nice. So the last lay I'm going to be presenting on is Gishmar. He's the son of a king's baron. He's described as very handsome and noble. Um, however, nature had done him a grievous wrong in that he was uninterested and almost incapable of love. So this lack of love is seen as a kind of curse for him and it manifests in the situation where he injures himself while hunting. He shoots an arrow into the white hind and it rebounds and injures him in the thigh. And as the animal is dying, um, it states that his wound can only heal unless he is cured by a woman who will suffer for your love more pain and anguish than any other woman has ever known. And you will suffer likewise for her. So much so that all those who are in love, who have known love or are yet to experience it will marvel at it. So he's cursed with this situation that he has to suffer terribly being in love with a woman and she has to suffer back for him. He kind of accepts the situation and he ends up on a boat and the boat takes him to this far removed kind of ancient land and he meets this beautiful woman. She's entrapped by her much older husband and he's jealous of her looks and he's worried that she's going to enter an adulterous relationship with somebody else so he locks her up in this tower. 
and eventually they fall in love with each other, but they suffer for a really long time with fears that their love is unrequited. But eventually they do reveal their feelings and they spend a few years together in a secretive relationship, but it's devoted and loyal and just generally passionate and courtly. So eventually they do get discovered by spies, but they make a pledge to one another that they will not take another lover unless that lover can untie the knots that they will put in each other's clothes. So they tie the knots and they part. And after a series of time and a lot of um, moving around in the story, they eventually come back together and the woman is almost unable to untie his knot because she has suffered so intensely being separated from him and she almost doesn't recognize him and he almost doesn't recognize her. But eventually in the end, they are able to untie each other's knots and they reclaim their love. The lessons on courtly love that I took from this story is that it's really praising selfless love as an aspect of courtly love. They're both suffering pretty intensely for one another and they're doing it for each other's best interests. And this is especially contrasted with the selfish love that's coming from her husband jealously and trapping her and keeping her away from all other people. Also, it relates to the notion that love can be found when you're detached from others and from the rest of the world. And this is relating to the secretive nature of courtly love, how you enter in this relationship away from the prying eyes of other people and their opinions, and you're finding out this love on your own. And this is represented here because they do enter a secretive relationship, hiding it from the woman's husband. And in general, the woman is coming from a faraway land, pretty removed from where um, Gijimar comes from. So that's also a representation of their love being found detached from many other people. And the last aspect is a guidance by fate. So both of them accept that their fate is going to involve suffering really intensely for their love and they don't reject their fate but they let it guide their lives and it works out really well for them in the end. So my last question is, why do you think Marie de France chose this poem as the first lay presented out of 12? Are there certain themes regarding love presented that set the stage well for reading the rest of the lay? Here are my works cited, and these are links to all the pictures. Thank you for listening.